Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the first talk in a series of dialogues, tours, and panel discussions coinciding with Gaja Gallery's ongoing show, Fifth Passage in Search of Lost Time. So my name is Nicole of Gaja Gallery, and today we will be hosting a conversation between multidisciplinary artist and founding director of Fifth Passage, Suzanne Victor, and the show's curator, John Tung. So what's unique about today is that unlike other conversations where the artist is the one interviewed, here the artist asks the questions and the curator is the interviewed. So they will discuss, among other things, the conceptual underpinnings surrounding the show, how the exhibition became a site for resurfacing memories of the art init artist initiative, and the basis for its historical and statement. I'd just like to remind everyone that at the last 15 minutes of this lecture, we will be opening up the Q&A with our audience. Sorry, last 30 minutes of this lecture. We'll be opening up the Q&A with our audience. So feel free to type in your questions at the Q&A box anytime throughout the talk, and we'll respond to them later. I'd also like to inform everyone that this talk is being recorded, just so everyone knows. Um, okay, and now just to give a brief background on the exhibit that's currently on view at our Singapore space, it features the seminal Singaporean artist initiative, Fifth Passage. In 1991, Fifth Passage was founded by a small group of emerging Singaporean artists who strive to bring the arts to the public. They set up their space in the fifth floor passageway of Parkway Parade, one of Singapore's first major suburban malls, and thus situated themselves within the ready-made public of civic centers. There, artists experimented with varied site-specific mediums and addressed a wide range of so social concerns from race, gender, to the environment. Bringing together artists who had presented works under its auspices, the show looks to memories of the fifth passage ex existence to reconstitute a basis for establishing the initiative's significance within the wider arc of the country's arts and culture cultural development. Now, I'm very delighted to introduce our speakers for today, Suzanne Victor and John Tung, as I mentioned earlier. A leading figure in Singapore's contemporary art scene, Suzanne Victor is a Singapore-born, Sydney-based artist who creates intimate, intimate or large-scale installations, public artworks, and performance art. She is best known for searching the dimensions of human sensorial experience by mining materials from the body, the natural elements of light, water, and sound to the science of physics, together with engineering components and the ready-made. Her works are recognized for their critical engagement with the cultural aftermath of post-colonialism in Southeast Asia and the politics of female disembodiment. Victor was the first female artist to re represent Singapore at the Venice Biennale. Her works have also been commissioned for other notable exhibitions, such as the Sixth Havana Biennale, the second Asia Pacific Triennial of, Triennial of Contemporary Art, the sixth Guangzhou Biennale, and the fourth Singapore Biennale. In 2017, she was singled out in the Sun Shower Exhibition in Tokyo to be honored by the Fukuoka Asian Art Museum with a special artist residency. Her 1998 performance, Still Waters, became the theme of the M1 Singapore Fringe Festival in 2019. Today, her works reside in the collections of numerous public and private collections worldwide. John Tung is an independent curator and exhibition maker. A former assistant curator at the Singapore Art Museum, he curated and co-curated nine exhibitions alongside serving as the co-curator for the Singapore Biennale 2016 and 2019. Three of the artwork commissions he curated for the Biennales were finalists for the Vanessa Prize with one work winning the prestigious award. His recent appointments as an independent curator include festival curator for the seventh Singapore International Photography Festival, Departing and Arriving, and associate curator for the open house program for the house, against the house, pa passion made impossible. He continues to work on numerous independent projects and publications. He holds a BA in art, art Management, awarded by Goldsmiths, University of London, LaSalle College of the Arts, and an MA in Cultural Management from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, where he graduated on the Dean's List. Suzanne and John, it's an honor to have you both join us today, and we all look forward to hearing you both go even deeper into the significance of the show and the Fifth Passage. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you, Nicole, for that introduction. 
So, well, I think um, I shall do the start, right? Yeah. Uh, good afternoon and thanks to everyone who's joining us virtually today. Welcome to this wide ranging conversation with independent curator and writer John Tung. Um, and as you have heard, he has been introduced um, by uh, Nicole before and his wide experience, which is more than 10 years of curating independent projects, working with artists, institutions, corporate and private um, clients as well. And I found out that he's a fishing enthusiast and also discovered with much envy that John is a volunteer mentor for prison inmates. But um, John, hi, how are you today? I'm good, I'm good. Very happy, you know, uh, second day of the exhibition, the opening to the public, we opened to the public today and um, a lot of enthusiasm from everybody uh, who has uh, come and joined us uh, and see the exhibition. So I'm in a really good mood today. Great. Maybe I shall set the scene mm -hmm. by saying that these extraordinary pandemic times that we're living through and living in has not prevented extraordinary projects to be realized. And the exhibition that you curated that's presented by Gaja Gallery in search of lost time, well, it is the brainchild of Gaja Gallery and is persuasively one of them. So um, it is not to be self-congratulatory, but because it is also uh, a project of risk. To realize this inquiry into the slipperiness and slippages of history writing, and by extension, the power to shape public memory, Gaja Gallery has um, you know, engaged you to create this evidence-based historicization yeah. of Fifth Passage's significant contributions to the arts against the background of Singapore's you know, visual and cultural production. And um, it is probably an attempt also to redress um, the self-aware occlusions by historians, academics, institutions, and writers. Um, and I think I would not be exaggerating to describe Fifth Passage in Search of Lost Time, the exhibition as 30 years in waiting. And we are here today. Um, so we are here also with the um, realization of the exhibition. We are also on the cusp of you know, a shift towards an ethics of recognize, recognition, recognition, the act of remembering and bearing witness. So I think um, before we start the interview, I would like to um, thank every artist in this show for their very deep and meaningful contributions. And they are Chu Chu Yuan, John Klang, Kai Lam, Ray Langenberg, Jason Lim, Susie Lingham, Siu Ki Leong, Eve Tan, and Susie Wong. Um, so kudos to all of them for uh, participating in this show. Um, I think to provide uh, an overview of the exhibition, I'd like to ask you, John, how you settled on the title In Search of Lost Time? I think that, um, you know, personally, I've been very, very interested with Fifth Passage since my days as a student uh, more than 10 years ago. And in art history class, um, Fifth Passage was raised as actually an example along a list of uh, contro controversies, uh, not just in Singapore, but in the international art world. I remember going home after that particular lesson and uh, you know, trying to Google and discover more information about Fifth Passage. And as much as I was able to discover that Fifth Passage had been in operation for quite a, a, a significant period of time, you know, a period of six years, I couldn't find any information um, about the rest of their activities uh, beyond uh, a few controversial moments um, um, in the in, during the period of their operation. And so when I embarked on this project, I was very, very cognizant of um, what was lacking in terms of academic writing pertaining to the arts initiative. Um, there was no substantial body of uh, literature that I could rely on. And so in that regard, I decided to turn to uh, another source, which was the memories of all of the artists uh, who had participated and presented artworks under the auspices of Fifth Passage. 
uh, quite interestingly, at during that moment in time, my wife uh, was actually baking at home, and she had just discovered the joy of uh, baking medallions. Um, and the medallions feature very, very prominently in, I think, one of the most important literary works ever written, uh, which was titled In Search of Lost Time by Marcel Proust. Um, and there's an expression uh, called uh, that there goes uh, the Madeleine de Proust. Uh, something is uh, my Madeleine de Proust, something is my Proustian Madeleine, uh, which refers to an object uh, which is ubiquitous that we encounter all the time. Um, yet it's an object that uh, raises memories from deep within the abyss of our minds. You know, it sends us back to that moment. Uh, the recollection of these involuntary autobiographical memories. And I was also ruminating on you know, the range of materials that artists at Fifth Passage have employed for their art making processes. And Suzanne, I'm not sure if you can recall very, very early on you know, when we were talking about this idea, and I, was, and I mentioned to you about you know, something as ubiquitous as an eggplant. And I had wondered, you know, like, you know, do you think about that moment at Fifth Passage when you installed fresh eggplants? You know, on the wall, every time you you encountered eggplants on sale at the market. And I felt that the same must necessarily be true, true you know, for all of these other artists who employed a wide range of materials who would have encountered, um, you know, everyday objects and experiences that would have sent them back in time. And so the curatorial process, you know, really focused a lot on this idea of memory. What can be surfaced from memory itself. And from all of um, these recollections from the various artists piece together a narrative um, about the ideals and aspirations and what Fifth Passage stood for. Yeah, that, that's a very um, good way to segue into an important component of this research process. Um, and obviously, you know, voluntary and involuntary memory as you're talking about because we are engaging in an act of remembering yep. um, so i think that um do you think you can um tell us what you discovered because part of this as i said one of the important parts of this process prior to the exhibition is you know that you um coordinated all these interviews yep. with many, many artists and individuals who have in some way been associated with Fifth Passage, you know, um, in the 90s. Can you tell us what you discovered in this interaction? Mm. So the process of the interviews in order to, because I, I wanted very much not to taint the responses um, of the artists that I was interviewing. Um, perhaps I was like maybe a little bit deceitful in that regard, but I went in blind, I pretended to go in blind and unaware um, other than beyond having the knowledge that they had participated at a fifth message show at one moment in time or another. And my line of inquiry revolved around um, what uh, was the nature of their participation, what else they had remembered from the initiative um, and extending to my ultimate question as to whether uh, they felt that uh, Fifth Passage was uh, significant and if they were aware of um, its occlusion uh, from art history. And I think, you know, all of the artists who had participated and presented on Fifth Passage before felt that this um, occlusion from art historical writing, occlusion from a larger arc of this country's um, art development is exceedingly apparent. And all of them uh, basically provided their own uh, takes on what was exceptionally noteworthy and important uh, that Fifth Passage had contributed to the cultural landscape, especially at that point in time. Uh, I think, you know, amongst many of the responses, I think there were a few that stood out, uh, such as I'm not going to name anybody specifically because sometimes I guess some of these memories were shared in confidence, but also the realization that at that point of time, there was no great availability of you know, venues for the presentation of art or for people to come together, um, artists to come together to share their artworks and to have a platform to present it. 
And thus, a number of artists recognize um, this very, very significant function that Fifth Passage had to play, you know, not only in terms of providing a space, but a space that um, audiences had easy and ready access to uh, within the shopping mall. So that definitely uh, was something that came up a lot and also something that I was cognizant of. Uh, for me, I guess, you know, a lot of the process about writing art history is also this fixation on the idea of significance, whether something is significant and whether something uh, necessitates um, a writing into art history itself. But I think that a question that has not really been addressed is that with relevance to this idea of significance, um, are the moments significant because um, they are written about or are they significant, therefore they are written down? And in the case of Fifth Passage, it is quite apparent to me that given the number of uh, groundbreaking activities that uh, they had organized, the exceedingly important function that they had played uh, within the arts and cultural landscape of that time, uh, its significance and the, the way it fits into the social memory um, is undoubtedly there. So it seems that the writing of art history itself makes things significant more than significant things get written into art history. And you know, part of this project was to highlight to people's attention that there were a large number of activities that were firsts uh, and firsts that were presented at Fifth Passage. For instance, uh, all women exhibitions, um, not just exhibitions focusing on the theme of womenhood, but just women coming together to celebrate their personal uh, identity. And you know, one of these exhibitions, of course, was Selves, as early as, I think, 1992, if my memory uh, serves me right. Which four women artists, you know, um, who were classmates together with very, very, very divergent uh, art practices coming together to present their artworks. And later on again, the Pisoni exhibitions, um, uh, which featured all women artists uh, celebrating womanhood and femininity. So these were, I think, undoubtedly significant events in Singapore's art history. But at the same time, beyond exhibitions itself, um, Fifth Passage really reached out to an exceedingly large demographic. And it was not just art lovers who think that, 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 we, that you know, we, we have these perhaps preconceived notions of people going to art fairs, um, adults, but children as well. Um, an incredible array of um, children's art programs um, that were created by Fifth Passage Initiative. You know, one of the very notable ones being Book Theatre, uh, which had one edition being commissioned by Mita, the Ministry of Information and the Arts back in the day for the courtesy campaign, which traveled to 24 schools and venues. Um, that, you know, would have counted, you know, thousands of people uh, amongst its audiences, which necessitates, you know, uh, the placement of uh, fifth, fifth Passage within the social memory of a country. Um, and so resurfacing um, some of these key milestones were very much uh, a part of this project's impetus. Yeah, if I may add also that uh, Fifth Passage presented the site-specific women's show at uh, the old Kandang Kabao Women's Hospital. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, um, where art by women resided side by side with the lived reality of women birthing, mm -hmm. um, you know, children, babies, yeah. and for that matter, side by side with the termination yeah. um, of, of uh, pregnancies and all that. Yeah. Um, and it, it might be a very good time to also thank Susie Wong for, you know, um, completing um, this particular exhibition because uh, at that time I had to I had to leave for Australia, so I had started curating it and putting it together, and ultimately it was Susie um, Wong who um, finished it. Um, and along the lines of Persone 2, uh, XX Persone 2, uh, also an exceedingly groundbreaking work, especially when we consider how when we go into a public hospital today, uh, we do 
see more art on the walls, a lot of art on the walls. But at that particular point in time, uh, I believe the hospital's director had actually come out to say that this was the first time an art exhibition was being presented at a hospital. So the first time in Singapore uh, that a site-specific art exhibition was taking place in the hospital complex itself. And looking back now, an exceedingly significant moment. Yeah, it was a continuation. I mean, when I thought about it, it was very, very exciting to, um, you know, um, to transform this, you know, what you would think are just um, spaces of no meaning, whether it's a corner, a passageway, a corridor in a hospital, and in Fifth Passages Parkway Parade venue, it's obviously a, you know, it's a passageway, literally. Um, so these became zones for art. Um, and hopefully, you know, when we uh, print the, the interview with Iris Tan, we'll go further and deeper into that. Mm -hmm. the, in, the impact of uh, Fifth Passage, because of its proximity to that kind of demographic, um, and to be able to, to divert art and art audience, to generate new publics, actually, mm -hmm. outside of the city centre, away from the um, institutionalised network and the commercial network of galleries, because uh, the idea at the time um, when I saw Parkway Parade and, and the way that it was attracting thousands and thousands of people um, to, to tap into this demographic because it really is a ready-made public yeah. and yeah. there's no more natural, you know, uh, space to do this than, you know, with a public that's in a space that's a de facto community centre in Singapore. The yes. shop and yeah, they call it a center. civic center. We had this conversation right. about the exactly. civic center itself. And, and you know, most of the time a shopping mall does not uh, come to the people's mind. We say civic center, people don't think of shopping mall, but it no. it's I think exceptionally true in the Singapore context. You know, yeah. like it's the de facto gathering point of people. Yeah. Yeah, it's a ready-made space, you know, with ready-made publics for us to actually um, tap into. Mm -hmm. um, and with the book theatre, you know, um, I remember Susie was working full time and um, she was writing the script uh, yes. for all the stories. So let me just expand a little bit, John, on yes, book yes, please. because really it was a way to reach the younger audiences through art. Um, and so um, Susie would be inventing, uh, I'm just putting a bit more light because it's getting dark in um, over here. <laughs> so... Um, because we are reaching these younger audiences and we wanted to do it through art and Susie was creating these storylines and the whole idea was that um so the courtesy roadshow for example is not courtesy campaign but it's the mm. courtesy roadshow and so we traveled to you know so many venues um and the storylines were very very engaging and the children could actually come up to this gigantic book with these gigantic pages that you know, I was one of the courtesy buttons, so to speak. So we were doing all kinds of things, multitasking, you know, all over the place. And the children would be invited to come up and effect the storyline. So if they were to choose to say, oh, yes, Sir Stephen Jaitis, Sir, how did she call Spongivitis, spongivitis. No, no, spongy Stephen, joints. Stephen Spongy fighters, that's yes. right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, um, how, how would you, you know, um, what choices would you make? We asked the children. And then they would, you know, interact with the page and with, you know, particular props that are inside that page and the page would turn. So this became, you know, very much, I mean, the, the, when I was thinking about the Fifth Passage venue in Parkway Parade really was founded upon um, bringing art to the people, yeah. you know, rather than for audiences to have to go to a, 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 a location or a, you know, a site or a space to see art, that art would be coming to them. Yes. And so the book theatre literally did that as well because mm -hmm. it was so mobile. Um, it's really great to reminisce with you about this. Um, I was wondering... Um, what did you uncover or discover about Fifth Passage, you know, through this process that is not public knowledge other than what you've said, not in the public domain? Yeah. I think that uh, pouring through the archives of yourself and um, Susie Lingam, 
um, I think that was one of the most illuminating uh, processes of this entire exhibition making process and coming across certain documents and certain uh, presentations that were made uh, pertaining to the aftermath of uh, the Brother Kane controversy. And I think in many ways, I had also vicariously experienced uh, and could feel the, the trauma that artists such as yourselves and others who were involved in that point of time must have felt. Um, the number of documents where Fifth Passage tried earnestly to um, you know, clear the air, uh, set the record straight, uh, and undo the misrepresentation that was going on at the media, going on in the media at that point of time. You know, the sheer amount of mischaracterizations that was going on, and I think continue to persist to this day, uh, really struck me. It really stood up to me. Um, and viewing documents such as Fifth Passage's presentation to Professor Tommy Cole at the National Arts Council, you know, to really set the record straight and you know, and say and almost say that you know, um, Fifth Passage is not about just about these controversial uh, events, you know, and we produce this wide array of um, arts and cultural activities that you know, art history has not taken note of. Um, your own presentations as well, written earlier, your open letter to the media, um, trying to set the record straight as to how uh, the AGA was developed, um, as well as Susie's essay, Transcending Space, which was supposed to come out in commentary, the NUS Society journal that was suppressed in the end and you know, was not published until two years later. Um, in uncovering you know, these documents and these correspondence and in reading through them, um, something that struck me was uh, the timeliness of things and how you know, so much of these you know, articulations and you know, um, attempts to, to, to exonerate oneself, I think completely fell on deaf ears and the media, uh, I think, played a very, very, very big role in um, hyping up a controversy and creating a fixation on controversy itself, rather than portraying the fullness of the picture, a big picture of the events. Um, in addition to that, I also you know, saw uh, a huge amount of uh, misrepresentation and inaccurate facts that continue to persist in these days, and especially in very, very significant and important records, such as parliamentary proceedings as well. Um, I think it was a Brigadier General George Yeo, then Minister for the Arts, who, Anivo, <laughs> who basically equated the performance of Joseph to have been uh, by Fifth Passage itself, uh, which you know of course is now immortalized in the annals of history of parliamentary proceedings. So these kind of of um, information these kind of facts that you know, I have uh, included into the timeline wall of the exhibition and will be included and fleshed out in greater detail in the exhibition catalog. I think these are moments that um, anybody would have a very, very strong emotional response to. And I think people can commiserate with that sense of injustice that you know, the artists have had to live with for 27 years now, 20, yeah, 27 years now. Yeah, I, um, it is true. The story of Fifth Passage is, you know, one of collective trauma. Um, and it's also, you know, you know, it epitomizes the effects of um, social exclusion, um, you know, cultural, you know, expulsion, um, public shaming. I mean, they're all hallmarks of, you know, what you would term as you know, trolling and 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 cancelling and 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 whatever we see today, except that we didn't have the terminology at the time. I mean, we were left holding the fort literally because, you know, many parties distanced themselves from us, um, even though we were co-organizers um, and we were not, you know, alone in organizing this um, the AGA event. You know, the event in question. 
Um, and it became this, you know, very unwanted social memory, um, you know, and an inconvenient truth, if you like, you know, um, and that that calls for repression and, and intentional forgetting. Mm. Um, I can say that, you know, in terms of my own experience, um, it was the case, you know, it, it is traumatic. Um, and for Iris, definitely, you know, Iris Tan, our Fifth Passage manager who went through, you know, uh, who was personally prosecuted uh, and went through the high court trials, you know, yep. which was very, very stressful to say the least, you know, um, it was traumatic for her and I'm sure for Susie, uh, co-founder as well. Um, so as we come to this particular part of um, this, uh, of our conversation, I, throughout this process as we were preparing for this exhibition, uh, it had always come into my mind, um, but I didn't get the opportunity to ask you and which I would ask you now, you know, did the relative, well, not relative, did the heaviness or relative heaviness of this subject matter affect you? Yeah. You know, having to read this because we need to think about vicarious trauma as well. Yeah, yeah. I think very, very much so. And it is something that I was, I try to be very, very, very sensitive to, um, especially when I talk to artists about these memories. I think Susie Wong um, summarizes you know, her sentiments very, very well in the artwork that she has presented. Uh, and she shared a quote with me uh, pertaining to the will to forget. Um, and, you know, what she had shared with me, I think, was a very, very good reflection of um, the entire process of putting these, this exhibition together. Because, you know, the resurrection of memories is not always just happy ones. Um, and as much as, you know, a lot of the exhibition writes on how much people can remember, so, so as to provide me with starting points for further research, um, not all of these memories are memories that you know, the artist wants to keep. Some of them are painful, traumatic personal experiences that you know they want to be free of at the same time. And so I was also very aware of this reopening of old wounds. And when I, you know, hear of like the personal sharings from yourself, um, as well as Susie, um, I think many a times I feel this great sense of injustice that has been perpetrated and that has not been righted, you know, over the period of 30 years. And, you know, I think a lot of artworks also intimate this sense of pain um, that comes um, along with bearing this burden of memory, um, the memory is a burden in itself. You know, earlier on, you had mentioned about <clears throat> parties that you knew turning away from yourself. And in, it would, I, it's the, rea the lived reality would have been so much worse, especially you know, just looking at um, what's on the timeline um, to have essentially been barred from entering NIE premises uh, because uh, you know, the Ministry of Education wanted to distance themselves for fifth passage uh, because they, were, they themselves were reliant on NAC grants, uh, the auspices in which uh, Suzy uh, presented the word renunciation at its substation, NEC having called up Popal Kun to remove her from uh, the exhibition roster lest he lose his, his, uh, his funding for the program. Um, but at the same time, I'm so, so very glad that you know, there were individuals such as Popal Kun at that point of time who would still stick to their guns and basically say, say no to an uh, uh, entity as powerful as the National Arts Council. Uh, and say that Suzy Lingam will continue to perform. And, you know, with her work that, with, with renunciation and, and the new work that she's you know, presented now, Undo Undone, you know, the original performance was an expression of, you know, this feeling of being scapegoated, you know, scapegoated by so many parties, uh, parties which, you know, the number of forum letters that were written by people who didn't even attend the events. Uh, and I think an artist like Susie having to kind of like re revisit that again, try to, to return that poor chair back to a state of innocence. Um, you know, moments like these, you know, all of these retellings certainly affected me on a, 
a deeply emotional note, uh, which is why I think, you know, this, I, I spent a lot of time and effort in putting together this uh, exhibition timeline. Um, I felt that, you know, through this representation of the facts of the matter, um, and that's what I had chosen to keep it as, you know, without my own readings uh, and without inter trying to interpret the facts, I was basically list every piece of information that I could find. That was the best kind of redress almost that I could seek uh, for what the spirit of the passage would actually be like. So if anything else, you know, the, that feeling, that vicarious trauma which I experienced in the process for me, uh, made me work. Made me work on it more fervently. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that sharing. Um, because we're talking about, um, you know, uh, you mentioned about being barred from NIE, myself and Susie. Yeah, I, right. I want to give a shout out to Ray, Ray Langenbach, because you know it. It takes uncommon courage to actually write it um, and document it, which he did in his um, thesis, um, performing the Singapore state. Um, so thanks, Ray, for actually putting that, you know, in writing in your thesis and in your, you know, in, in the way that you analyzed um, this event, which was part of his analysis. Um, this might be a good time also, I think, to talk about, um, so the politics of exclusion and erasure, you know, as which is what we're talking about. Mm. And, and I want to register that the politics of exclusion and erasure is a lived reality that many women artists are so familiar with. So I want to, um, ask you, can you share with us any insights that you might have gained with regards to the nature of women's artistic labor in the 90s, in the course of your interview, uh, of your interviews of many artists, in the course of your research, um, and its impact upon the current generation of women artists? Right. Is know, there any insight that you might have you know, yeah. gained? I personally also very much do not want to, you know, kind of like jump into the realm of like speculation alone. Um, but, you know, just look at the circumstantial evidence. Um, it is very, very clear that uh, Fifth Passage, you know, was co-founded by uh, three women artists spearheaded by himself, uh, making it an exceptionally notable endeavor in its own rights alone. Um, and its characterization is has never been thoroughly examined. This characterization is exceedingly problematic in history. And so much of what has been written remains fixated on the male form. Um, Ellen Wee, in response to visiting the exhibition yesterday, uh, Ellen Wee, co-founder of Open House, had commented that um, the, the martyrdom, the specter of a heroic male body uh, is also present within this exhibition it's in itself. And uh, in, in, an, in a way that almost becomes inevitable because so much of the passages characterization has revolved around the, a particular male body. Um, and in all of that writing uh, that has transpired so far and the return to the masculine form again, uh, the writing of, of, of the function women played in the arts initiative was occluded as a result. Because once again, under fixation of the heroic male body. Can I say that uh, these writings were intentionally trying to occlude? I cannot say that with a, a great degree of certainty, but what is certain is that it was included. Uh, it was occluded. It was included. It was very much occluded until uh, Dr. Michelle Antoinette came along and, and, and wrote um, Banishing Sites, which was published by Rutledge fairly recently, only last year. 
Vanishing acts. Vanishing acts, sorry, yes. And, and you know, give a thorough examination of the very, very critical role of the plate. Um, and it seems like this has very much been the case uh, in art history, hasn't it? You know, uh, the reliance on, on the heroic male to basically further the narrative of art history. To author, and, to author. Yeah, to author as well, to author as well. And, and yeah, so I think I just want to leave it as that. Yeah. Um, one of the um, questions that uh, I'd like to pose to you, you know, um, it might be an up, it, it might be a curatorial question, but um, the exhibition is primarily ocular or visual, mm -hmm. um, a visual experience, and will only be survived by a document, which is the catalog, and so as well as personal memories that testify to his existence. Yep. You know? So at the end of the exhibition, do you think that there is any aspect of this project that might have proven ungraspable? It's like performance, you know? Any aspect of this project that's ungraspable, intangible, um, that resists capturing um, in the final analysis? So um, any aspect of this project that resists accountability, resists representation, resists reinterpretation, you know, and resists recognition? And if so, how and why? I think inevitably, you know, there's going to be a lot of this, you know. Uh, I, I think at best, this exhibition only manifests as a survey, a survey of the many, many memories that are associated with this message itself. And at the end of the exhibition, you know, um, it's encapsulated and distilled into a tiny little volume. Um, the exhibition itself has 10 participating artists. It, you know, the whole entire issue of representation comes into play. Uh, can can, the, can, can a, an, a small exhibition and a, and a timeline represent the entire ethos and spirit of an art in, initiative? Can it represent, you know, the idealism of uh, young women with a mission of bringing arts to a wider public? Uh, I think it can only intimate at that to a very, very small degree. And ultimately, it remains that people have to fill in and try to imagine the rest of the details for themselves. You know, just prior to us you know, starting this interview and going live, I had use the example of Atlantis and, you know, raising Atlantis from the depths. And one can only, you know, the raising of Atlantis from the depths, you know, has happened with the manifestation of this show. Uh, but it is also necessary for Atlantis that has been raised now to be re-recorded onto other maps, other maps of the world and reconnecting its presence, you know, to other moments in art history in Singapore. And I think, of course, I will continue to play a role in, in the reinsertion of um, and reconnection of it to this larger arc of art historical development and cultural development um, in Singapore. But I think many other parties have to step up to that as well. It cannot be the task of um, one individual curator alone or necessarily one curator. It, that's not necessarily, it should not necessarily be the task of art history alone as well, you know, uh, to ensure that, you know, these events are properly documented and take hold and take shape within a larger social media. Yeah, um, well, talking about memory, right, I, I, you know, there is a morality to memory. Um, you know, there's a morality to the, to the way we remember. Um, it's as important as the means by which we remember, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, Fifth Passage in Search of Lost Time is, is you know, is, is, is a demonstration of, of that. And I think um, it's a deeply meaningful show for me, um, you know, that you've presented with Gaja Gallery to the public, mm -hmm. um, uh, and for which we thank you and the gallery. Um, 
I also see it as a historiography by inversion, you know, like pulling, pulling a print from the deep recesses of a plate um, because, you know, we are focusing on those gaps. Mm -hmm. um, we are focusing on those, um, anything that's so obscured. Um, so I think that remembering is a performance. Um, and it, has, it, it has deeply, um, it has deep ethical and moral value in and of itself. Um, yeah. So what do you hope to be the legacy of this show that you and Gaja Gallery has created? I think the legacy of this show is already starting to take root. You know, the number of uh, you know, the very, very positive response uh, from visitors who came to the gallery and see the show yesterday. Um, the recognition of a much larger body of work that was produced by the Arts Initiative um, beyond uh, secular performances um, in itself. Uh, that is me uh, pointing towards uh, a more thorough characterization that you know, is now on the horizon. Um, in putting together something like an exhibition timeline, of course, the ultimate goal for that is to start providing numerous starting points for future explorations um, of um, the various activities that the, the initiatives embarked on and how that connects and feeds into um, the rest of the arts and cultural landscape of Singapore of that time and the role that it plays in its evolution into the present day. Um, so that's what I see um, the exhibition doing. And also to just kind of like touch a little bit on this idea of memory and remembering, um, you know, that you, you raised briefly um, within your question. Uh, an, in, an interesting, maybe perhaps I can call it a fun fact, um, is that there's a particular text in the curatorial statement, you know, which talks about uh, perhaps it's suggestive and evocative of the, the precarious nature of the methodology that was employed. Um, and it's a line that reads, the remembrance of things past is not necessarily the remembrance of things as they were. Um, and I quite intentionally tried to give emphasis to that line by italicizing it, in hopes that perhaps some people would actually go and Google that line. Uh, and for the few that do, uh, would have Googled that line, they would have seen that, oh, that line was a line from Proust, uh, from In Search of Lost Time. And the irony of that matter is that um, I have read, I think, two versions of Proust, two different translations of Proust, uh, the original remembrance of things past, translated by Moncrief, uh, and the second version when it was retitled to In Search of Lost Time. And the interesting bit is that that line actually never ever shows up in the novel. Um, and so I think that provides something worthy and something interesting to consider about this particular process. It also intimates about how certain things that are lost can never be fully recovered um, through such a methodology. Can the, a, spe a, spe a specific date be re from 30 years ago as to when an exact incident happened uh, be remembered if it was not recorded? And so, you know, it once again, um, returns to this, you know, issue of timeliness. Is there a time for the writing of certain things? And is there an ex expiration of a memory itself? And once, you know, that moment has elapsed, once that moment has passed, uh, how much can necessarily be recovered? I think that's also part of what is present within this exhibition here. Um. So talking about the exhibition, I was wondering, John, if you would um, share with the audience who have not visited the exhibition, you know, the individual artworks um, in the show, mm -hmm. um, and obviously the, the artists, you know, that you've curated into the show. Right. Um, so maybe I'll just share a little bit about the process of how, you know, this artist list had um, been put together to begin with. Just, uh, yeah. Um, so the entire exhibition preparation for it really began nine months ago. 
Um, and the first thing that I looked to was, you know, the archival collections of yourself and Suzy Lingam, the documents that uh, the two of you had preserved and taken that as a starting point to reach out to a number of artists um, to share with me their memories of the events uh, and the nature of their participations. And my last question to each one of those artists were, would you be interested to participate in a uh, fifth message exhibition? Uh, and for a number of those uh, which affirm positively to that, um, are the names that you know, we see it within the exhibition today. And they, of course, uh, include yourself <laughs> uh, and Suzy, as well as Suzy Wong, Kai Lam, Ray London Park, John Clang, Jason Lim, Chu uh, Chu Yuan, and Chu Chu Yuan as well. Um, now, and all I, of them. May I interject there? Yeah. I just wanted to make sure that um, we remember this because we are in the act of remembering. Yeah. Um, Chu Chu Yuan is the um, senior manager at the Singapore Art Museum who had kickstarted the archiving of Fifth Passage. And I want to um, acknowledge her role in this. And also that now uh, Fifth Passage's um, material, archive, archived, uh, Fifth Passage archives are now um, lodged with the National Gallery of Singapore. Um, and to thank people like that, like Chu Yuan, um, who has, you know, well, um, started this, very, very long process of um, archiving. Mm -hmm. So back to you, John. Yeah, and the way that the exhibition has been curated and corresponds roughly to three temporal zones, if I can call it that. Uh, the moment, uh, well, sorry, not moment, uh, the time preceding the Artist General Assembly itself, uh, a section with more of a focus on the Artist General Assembly and a final section uh, pertaining to the aftermath, the consequences of the artists' uh, general assembly. And so the artworks from these various artists uh, have been placed in accordance with these um, time zones. Uh, for instance, um, John Clang, uh, you know, for John Clang, Fifth Passage was a very, very significant moment for him. Uh, he was 20 years old and it was his first exhibition. And as I understand from him, uh, it was a jury exhibition and he actually had to bring his photographs down uh, to be considered uh, to have his photographs up for consideration before he was finally um, given that presentation. And so those artworks in the first uh, section of the exhibition correspond to that part of the period. And of course, it's impossible to completely escape um, the, the role that the AGA had in transforming uh, and shaking up fifth message resulted in them losing uh, their space, the original space at uh, Parkway Parade, uh, but at the same time uh, created a new moment and offered you know a new way of presenting art you know in untenanted shop houses at Pacific Plaza later on. So with the, in, in the last section, that's where uh, we have worked from individuals such as Chu Chu Yuan who participated in the exhibition Surrogate Desires, the very, very first exhibition um, that opened at Pacific Plaza, actually still in the midst of the Brother Kane Hot Trials. Um, I thought you'd be, you, you, you might, you know, <laughs> present so, uh, all the different artworks. Um, no, so I don't want to spoil it so much for the audiences. I really think that it should. Uh, everybody who can make it should come down and take a look at it. And um, if they are unable to, uh, a meta plot capture of the exhibition will also be available, which means that um, no matter where you are in the world, you can also experience the exhibition, albeit in a vicarious manner. Yeah, we're not tied to physical sites anymore. <laughs> um, so what do you think what what how what do you think about working with non-institutional um entities like um Gaja Gallery. I'm so grateful to um Just Deep, you know, uh for thinking about putting on such a show. I must say that in, in many respects it is um unexpected um that a commercial gallery would take on such a massive art historical agenda. 
Um, and so really uh, kudos to Justin for that. Um, this particular, this exhibition at Dajra is actually, I think the first time I've ever worked with a commercial art gallery to realize an art exhibition. And, um, you know, for all the preconceived notions that um, people may have of what an art gallery is interested in, uh, namely the sale of artworks and the making of money, um, I think this passage exhibition really serves to debunk a lot of notions as well. Because uh, at the core of his being, at the core of Jasdeep Sandhu's being, uh, I really think, and I, I, I know that I think he's uh, listening in on this conversation right now, but the core of Jasdeep Sandhu's being is a uh, uh, soft, cuddly teddy bear with a great love uh, for art history and writing certain injustices in time. And so it has been a lovely experience and I have had so much support from um, the entire gallery team that has worked very, very, very tirelessly in order to realize this exhibition. Um, I would like to sound out individuals such as Aisha and James who have given me so much reassurances. Uh, and of course, Donna, who has worked very, very tirelessly on you know, ensuring the, that the presentation of information in this show um, is the way that it has manifested in, which is beautiful and uh, which so many people have responded very positively to. Well, after that, I wonder if this question is going to have any relevance because I was going to ask <laughs> whether there are any last comments or it, don't have, it doesn't have to be last comments. Um, yeah, perhaps yeah, I, I still have like maybe a, a couple of sentiments that I would like to share and just like, you know, my hopes and dreams, you know, for really what this exhibition would inspire. Um, I think that, you know, within uh, the art of Singapore's art history, there remains many moments um, similar to Fifth Passage that have been unrecorded or if recorded have not been given enough attention, not been fleshed out in greater detail. And so as much as I hope this exhibition sparks uh, a formal and proper inclusion of um, the initiative into the annals of art history, I do hope that it also sparks more research into these other moments that have transpired um, in the past in Singapore's arts and cultural landscape as well. If you remember, John, we had a conversation and we spoke about um, your prison mentorship, yeah, your voluntary mentorship for yeah. prison inmates. And um, we likened the, um, so, so this is a reference to Eve's uh, wonderful installation in this show. Um, would you like to, you know, take that away? Yeah, um, so during my time at SAM, I, I was a, uh, curator, uh, a co-curator, uh, a few of the editions I had uh, done with my trusty teammate, uh, Andrea Fan. Uh, we went to Singapore Changi Prison to essentially um, offer mentorship and guidance to inmate artists who were art make, who were, you know, making art within the prison context. And um, the project has always been something that is very, very close to my heart and exceedingly important. Uh, so I was very, very grateful that the prison would actually reach out to me um, now as an independent curator to return um, to curate uh, this year's edition of the exhibition, uh, which opens uh, online um, in November, uh, a couple of months from now. Uh, you know, I think what it goes to show is that, you know, art plays such a crucial role in our lives. Um, I think that even within the confines of prison itself, uh, art proliferates, creativity proliferates. And in noting um, the developments, you know, that we've had in our arts and cultural line, landscape, in spite of uh, perhaps challenging circumstances, I think it goes to say that art is able to flourish uh, regardless of circumstance. And in fact, sometimes, the more adverse the conditions, the more creative artists are going to get. Yeah, yeah I think um, 
we also talked about how, um, you know, uh, I think I was describing this. Um, it's like being in exile. That fifth passage was in exile. Mm -hmm. And you were commenting on how that is, it's worse than being in prison mm. because it is, there's an indefinite end to it. You don't know where yeah. it ends. And yeah. you were commenting on how a prison sentence actually has a definitive completion. Indeed. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I wanted to um, remind you of this conversation on, and, on, and, and what we spoke about. Uh, and that you were also saying, and I'd like to, um, and I think you talked about how for the prison inmate, um, it may seem like um, they, are, they are disconnected from society, but in fact, you were saying yeah. that they are very, very, very much and very worried, you know, mm -hmm. about everything that's, go that's happening outside of the prison cell. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, would, do you want to expand on yeah, that? Yeah, so, yeah, to kind of like flesh out the details, you know, of, you know, what, yeah, of this earlier conversation that we had, you know, the idea of, a, of, of being in exile versus, as opposed to, to being in prison, you know, prison sentences have a, a very, very definite time frame. There is an uh, end point um, that one can look forward to, uh, but on the other hand, um, being in exile, one never knows when they can return. And I do believe that there are still some lasting legacies of this particular exile. Uh, I'm not certain if the ban on performance art, uh, sorry, the ban on Joseph and Shannon from performing has actually been lifted yet, uh, even in the Singapore context. And uh, the isolation, and the idea of isolation and insulation uh, from the rest of the world that people uh, think uh, that prison offers, you know, an island, uh, an island separated, uh, that many people do not think of what happens in prison, but that does not necessarily mean that inmates in prison do not think and are not affected by what's happening in the outside world. In fact, uh, the reality of the situation is that um, the experience is compounded because they're not in a position to respond to the situations that are changing and developing around them. And you know, the making of their artworks is perhaps one of the few means in which they can uh, offer up um, their responses and their takes you know, of um, these experiences that they had. Well, on that note, I want to thank Gaja Gallery and John Toom on behalf of Fifth Passage for doing the uncommon with such integrity and such deep respect for the scholarship of art history. Um, and as you've already mentioned, but I wanted to give this shout out to Dr. Michelle Antoinette for breaking the ring of silence, the 30 year ring of silence, almost 30 year ring of silence through her essay, Vanishing Acts. Um, remembering Fifth Passage in Singapore's contemporary art history in world art. Um, so uh, I would like to thank the audience for gifting the, for giving us their time today for this conversation. Um, and so I'll turn this over to Nicole for the Q&A. Yes, thank you for that, Suzanne, and thank you John as well for answering. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, we're, we're approaching the last 30 minutes for our time today. So we actually already started getting some questions from the audience as you, were, as you both were speaking. So we can start answering some. So one from an anonymous um, listener. Are there any plans for the interviews, recollections to be made available to present and future researchers? Um, so I guess I'll answer the question, right? Uh, no, there are no plans to do that because um, a lot of these memories were shared uh, to me in confidence um, and I have you know, no intention of uh, betraying that confidence. Uh, the process of um, those interviews were in that spirit. They had provided me with uh, numerous starting points to start you know, the excavation and the 
the recovery of information that um, is now seen on the timelines. Uh, so I have no plans to be reve revealing any transcripts from all of those conversations that I've had. So just to clarify, Nicole, was that the reference to that to those interviews or the um, or the conversations online and tomorrow's um, right, yeah. panel talk with Ray, Kai, and Jason? Um, it, it doesn't specify here in the question, but whoever asked that question, you can actually you can still type in if you would like to specify it further. Uh, we can move on to our next question, and this is for you, Suzanne. Oh. Also from an anonymous guest. So do you see any difference in the erasure policy of the 1990s and now? If so, why? Which policy again? In the erasure policies. Erasure. Yes. <laughs> you mean I, don't... I don't think it was a policy. Policy, yeah. I don't okay. think it was a policy. I think it's a, you know, um, it's 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 not something as easy and simple to to um, assign responsibility to. I think it's a culture, um, and I think that culture needs to. They read, you know, we have to read, it needs some kind of auditing. Um, and I, I definitely think that the way women artists are treated, the women's artistic labor, you know, um, I think definitely there is evidence of that, um, that it should change. This attitude, this culture that we have created needs to be examined. Thank you for that. Uh, we have another one here from Chu Yuan. So she said, firstly, I think the both of you, Suzanne, John, as well as Gaja for this exhibition and involving me in it. John, this is such an important show and kudos for bringing it about. You are in a unique position of having been a museum curator before this and now curating with a gallery. May I ask, you to share how you think the approach would have been and how different if this historical framing show had been mounted by a museum instead of a gallery? Well, that's an interesting, actually a very, very interesting question. And um, uh, it's something that I also wonder very, very, very much myself because I think for an exhibitionary survey such as this, one almost anticipates and expects it to be coming out of uh, a museum rather than uh, a commercial art gallery. And um, the fact of the matter is I did actually propose uh, a more thorough research of Fifth Passage, uh, potentially leading to an exhibition uh, when I was still as an, as an assistant curator at the Singapore Art Museum. I believe this was in 2019 when I raised this point, uh, but I guess nobody took me up on it. Uh, but what would be different would be the resources that an institution would have um, to put, put together an exhibition such as this. This exhibition is a labor of love for so many individuals, uh, the gallery itself, uh, myself, and all of the participating artists, right, uh, who have to, you know, put aside time, uh, sometimes from their regular daily jobs and make an investment uh, into making these artworks, you know, to correct um, uh, a mischaracterization that is, well, not exactly their job to correct in the first place. Um, so if this exhibition had been mounted in a museum instead of a gallery, uh, it would have had a lot more resources uh, to realize it. We could have perhaps anticipated artworks of significantly larger scale, perhaps the participation of more artists um, who uh, you know, were uncertain if they could commit to, to realizing an artwork within this short time frame, sometimes with the limited resources that they have. Uh, but that being said, um, I think that this is also an exhibition that touches on maybe certain sensitive elements 
um, in you know Singapore's art history, but I'm still optimistic of you know of what our local institutions can do, and there's no reason why another exhibition cannot be mounted down the road by either the Singapore Art Museum or the National Gallery uh, after this initial preliminary survey of this message itself. The beginning. <laughs> yes, yeah, so stick it. I, I hope to take this as just a start. We have one from Dr. Michelle Antoinette. So she's here today. She said, thank you, John and Suzanne. I thoroughly enjoyed hearing from you both today. Congratulations, John and Gajigali for recalling fifth, pa fifth passages significant. Yes, I agree, absolutely significant contributions to Singapore's contemporary art history. There is art history, but there is also the, gro the growing field of exhibition history, which I think your exhibition intersects with curatorially. Sadly, I haven't, I haven't yet had the opportunity to see, get a sense of the exhibition. I wonder if you would like to elaborate more on how your exhibition may help us to understand Fifth Passage as part of Singapore's exhibition history, as well as its art history. You mentioned a timeline, for instance. Your exhibition project, as with art history, will be registering Fifth Passage's significance too, and significant itself for being the first to revisit Fifth Passage in this way, and perhaps reflect on this intersection of art and exhibition histories. Well, that's a very, very, thank you, uh, Dr. Michelle Antoinette for that question. It is a really heavy going one. Um, and indeed, I also completely agree that um, the way this exhibition has manifest, you know, it is really intersecting both art history and um, exhibition histories as well. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of what Fifth Message has done uh, in terms of the format of the exhibition. Uh, that register itself as the initiative as being absolutely cognizant of what was happening uh, within uh, the larger arc of exhibition developments uh, in the country at the point of time. Um, and I make reference to uh, perhaps Sing Eugene's PhD dissertation on the rise of critical exhibitions in, in Southeast Asia. And he talks about the artist villages time show as uh, one of the first uh, presentations, exhibitions that you know looked critically at at, uh, the, at, at time itself, um, and it's interesting to note that that uh, Body Fields, uh, which was organised by Fifth Passage as well as uh, Artist Village, uh, sorry Body Fields as well as AGA, which was which was co-organised by Fifth Passage and Artist Village, also correspond to that particular format. Uh, which highlighting that you know it also technically fits um, into this growing this growth and development of um, exhibitions uh, and the way they were mounted uh, in Singapore. Uh, well, it's a long question. Let me see where I am at now. Sorry, she 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 actually sent a follow up. She just said to be clear, oh. the last part of my already submitted question. Could you please reflect on the intersection interplay of art history and exhibition history in your exhibition? I don't really have a very, very, very clear response for this, um, to be honest. Uh, and I do feel that maybe a distinction does not necessarily have to be drawn in such a clear manner. Uh, for me, this idea of exhibition history still remains a subset of this larger art, of art history. And the way that this timeline has been conceived is to really provide perhaps a consolidated resource of, um, of source material for future researchers and academics to work off. Um, my particular interest, which I think I will flesh out more fully later on within the exhibition catalog is to address this question of significance in itself. Um, uh, significance is something that is raised many times, often, uh, but you know, with reference to an artwork being significant or moments being significant. Uh, but I'm of the mind that for something to be significant, uh, there must be a signifier, and uh, 
there must be something that and and some and somebody to be signified to. So in the writing of both art history and exhibitions history as is being done now, uh, my question is what is being signified and to whom? Um, is it solely to art historians itself? Um, I'm of the mind that you know for art history to gain a wider relevance, it needs to find its intersections with the social history as well. Um, and I think what the exhibition timeline was trying to do was to prompt a realization and a recognition of how uh, these various activities that were uh, developed by Fifth Passage actually play a crucial role in the social memory of Singaporeans of that time. Thank you. Thank you. Me. Thank you, Dr. Michelle Antoinette. We have another one from Patricia Chen. Do you think the narrative would be any different if the show were to be run by a gallery? I think the narrative would be different depending on who conceptualized and curated such an exhibition, uh, regardless of um, the auspices it was held in, whether it was a gallery or a museum, you know, all of these facets would definitely produce a different result. The methodology of the researcher would produce a result um, and you know, put in place um, different findings. have another one from John Pang. Are there any plans to start Fifth Passage again? This will be very interesting and useful for the artists. And also he said, thank you, Suzanne, for giving me my first exhibition in my life. Oh, hi, John. Wish I could see you. Thank you so much for your question. Um, you know, we're Fifth Passage, if I may say that, um, we're so happy to, to see the development of your career. Um, as for starting Fifth, you know, I think um, Fifth Passage was started as a kind of the a zeitgeist of that time. And because so much has evolved, Singapore has changed so much. Um, if it, if, you know, if there's a Fifth Passage, um, it would be very much informed by the thinkers, um, the um, initiators, you know, the catalysts uh, for, for it. Um, and also is because um, the Fifth Passage was so responsive, so context specific, so site specific, and so um, need specific um, at the time. Uh, obviously, we're also talking about um, how much more regulated it is, you know, for the arts in Singapore now compared to the 90s. So there are very, very different conditions, very different climates um, that is operating now. But, you know, if Fifth Passage is, is if it were to be, um, to have a rebirth, you know, um, yeah, I agree. It'll be very, very interesting and useful. Um, you know, for artists and publics alike. Um, and to be able to generate even more new publics would be a fantastic thing. Thank you. I think that's our last question from the audience today. So we got quite a lot. Thank you so much to the audience for asking that, to everyone who asked. So that concludes our conversation for the day. Thank you again. To our audience for joining us and most especially to our speakers Suzanne and John for sharing your fascinating insights with us today and your recollections. So just some brief announcements. Our next virtual talk will be tomorrow, September 25, from 3 to 4 p.m. featuring a conversation with artists Jason Lim, Kai Lam, Ray Langenbach, who will, be, who will discuss the relationship between archiving and performance art. So we still have slots available and you can sign up for it through the link um, that's, our, that's featured in our social media pages. And for those who are still at, who are in Singapore, our physical exhibition just opened to the public today and will run until October 17. So please check out our website at gadgetgallery.com and our social media pages on Instagram and Facebook for further announcements on the show and our upcoming events. Thank you so much again.
Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone.